Well, Julio Jones knows all about patterns. Uh, he runs them as well as anybody. Uh, now he's getting familiar with a holding pattern. Uh, we just saw the Chris Sims, and uh, it's kind of a wait and see mode. In the meantime, the Seahawks are the new betting favorites to land Julio Jones for whatever that's worth in the aftermath of the news that he and Russell Wilson have been talking about uh, teaming up. How quickly things changed from it wasn't that long ago when uh, Russell Wilson looked like uh, he was about to run a fly pattern out of town. And now a DK Metcalf Julio Jones tandem cancel Christmas. Jason Johnson. Um, uh, yeah, exactly. I, just, I, I, I figured we start and there. Lock it. <laughs> it's 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 Christmas in July, fellas. It's Christmas in July. I would look if this were to happen. And again, I'm still concerned that the Seahawks resign KJ Wright. That's important. KJ Wright is still a, a free agent. He should, he's been a free agent too long. They need to make sure they show up that defense. But this says two things to me as a Seahawks fan. Number one, it confirms my belief all along. I don't think Russell was really, really trying to go. He's trying to put scare God in him. Sometimes you got to <laughs> come home it. from you the grocery call store. Some, sometimes you got to come home from a business trip and accidentally drop a phone number. Oh, where'd that come from? Just to make sure the people at home know <laughs> that you're still sought after, right? So that's what Russell was doing. That's what Russell was doing. And How now you get down, they. Man? <laughs> I mean, wait a minute. I like. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry because, like, like Jason, you can't. I, I don't know about you. I can't do that because that's a divorce and I ain't got a prenup. No, no marriage counseling, right. no trial separation. No. We're getting divorced and I don't want to get divorced. No. If body no. comes home I and she finds a dead body in my house, no. we get divorced. So I don't know why these phone numbers dropping. I don't know where you come from, but we don't roll like that in my house. This, this, no, is, this, this, this is theoretically how us single people think it works, right? This oh, okay. is my problem. This is clearly okay. my problem. Okay. Um, but, okay. But, but, but okay. Russ, like I said, I think Russ all along, like I said, I didn't think he was necessarily going to leave in the way that I think like Aaron Rodgers will. But here's the thing about Julio Jones. It not only shows that Wilson, if, if they get Jones, that Wilson won the battle, right? He won the battle over Pete Carroll. He won the battle over John Schneider. If they're serious about this, because remember, Wilson won an Antonio Brown last year. Like he wants a veteran's receiver there, not only as a safety valve for the offense, but somebody to probably mentor DK Metcalf, right? So that means he won the battle sort of putting the team together, but also this, it suggests that there may be some real changes coming to the offense, that it won't be what we had last year where the offense starts off hot and then it disappears because you don't bring in Julio Jones to, to, to throw the ball at him twice a game. You're, you bring in Julio Jones yeah. because you want Decaf, uh, uh, Lockett, and him to spread the field at all times. You're talking the air raid offense that they thought they were going to have down in Arizona. So I'm very excited about this. Julio is just basically going to be the scary. next. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, I think this has probably an 80% chance of happening, and I'm excited about it. Wow. Speaking of excited, speaking of excited, uh, let's take the fold of Jason Johnson again, please, because Jason, you made my day. <laughs> Uh, nothing else that I wanted. I, there's nothing else more important than this. I, I had a lot of things to ask you about, but primarily <laughs> I need to know where did you get the mayor Goldie Wilson? I like the oh. sound of that. I mean that yes. that right there, bruh. Yeah, I need to yes. know that is that is so that made my day to see that. That is yes. so, bruh. I once yeah. Jason, you gotta understand, Jason. I once cracked my front teeth trying to ride a skateboard like Marty McFly. Back to the Future is the greatest trilogy in the history of movies, in, as far as I'm concerned. And Goldie yes. Wilson, I'm gonna clean up this town. I'm gonna make a name for myself. I mean, can you just can you get me one of those, or at least tell me where you got it? I'm sorry to disrupt to, to, to derail the show, but that was just oh, no. too fire to let to let go un, 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 unacknowledged. I had to acknowledge that. That was incredible. That that you know, it's like I'm gonna clean up the town. You can start by mopping these floors, right? Like like it was. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a great moment. It's a great moment instead of it. Thank you for noticing. So here's here's the context of this. Number one, you know, it's not just the pop culture reference that we all grew up, we, we love, you know, Back to the Future's great, amazing movie, but also it's that internal political story. A black man in the 60s saying, I'm going to run for mayor of this small white suburban town, and people are like, nah, that ain't never going to happen. And by 1984, he's running for re-election, right? So it's also the story of yeah. sort of internal racial and political progress. I got this at a vintage toy shop, uh, when I was in Denver, Colorado earlier this week, I was so I, I was walking around the shop and I saw it there. I was like, I can't leave without this. And I will say this to all of the brother from another, 
uh, fans out there watching Peacock, everything else like that. The second one, so, so, so you guys hear this, the second poster I'm trying to get my hands on to complete my beautiful collection of black pop culture political paraphernalia, there is a campaign poster of when Ron and Dwayne ran for student body president at Hillman <laughs> College. <laughs> it hangs in the background of their, of their apartment okay. for the rest of the series. If I yeah. can ever get my hands on that, I, I, I'm That's complete. a wrap. I'm it's a wrap. It's a wrap. You, you Shut it down. <laughs> so let, let me ask you this. Let me ask you this then. Michael Smith just kind of dropped a, a, a nugget here. He said, Back to the Future, greatest trilogy. And do you agree with that? And if you, if you I, disagree, Give me, give me, uh, give me the, give me the winner. With, so here's the thing, and I Christopher usually Christopher Nolan's Batman usually, is up there. Christopher yeah, Nolan's Batman I, is kind of, it's, it's right there. Just to throw that out there, you know. So this is why, this is why I, I, I allow Michael to get away with that high take because in its category, in its category of sort of comedy adventure, it is the best, and it, it really is. Like if you want to talk to like action films, it's different. Then you would say like Christopher Nolan's Batman. Then you'd have to look at the Matrix trilogy. Then you'd have to look at say the first three Star Wars. But if you're talking about your sort of action comedies, most of them don't even get to a third movie. I mean, like, did anybody think Beverly Hills Cop 3 was good? No. <laughs> like, like no. you know, by tone no. and action, <laughs> yeah, like, Back to the Future, all three of those movies are legitimately good. American Pie, the third one, wasn't that great. You know, they're probably going to come up with my big, fat, Greek, you know, bris. I don't know. They'll have another one of those that's not going to be that great. So, yeah, I, I think as a trilogy, it, it really is one of the best. Michael J. Fox... I mean, the whole setup, and you want to talk about also the cultural impact. We got Rick and Morty because of that movie. Like, like <laughs> it lasted another forty or fifty years because Rick and Morty is basically just the cynical cartoon Venture Brothers version of Back to the Future. So, I, I stand, I and stand as, by that. As, I appreciate that. And and as Paul Rudd's Ant Man observed, everything we think we know about time tra travel came from Back to the Future. You know what I mean? Exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. you know, right. like, that was great. And, and Tony Stark told that us that great. it doesn't work that way. He's like, I'm going to stop you <laughs> right there, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> Did you just quote that? That was a great line. Great line. We we understood. You know, 860,000 yeah. gigawatts and, and DeLoreans and everything. But yeah, so that that's, you know, but Tell yes, I, I, I appreciate y'all acknowledging that. When I posted that, it was so oh, funny. I had incredible. so many people be like, yo, this is the mayor, blah, blah, blah. I didn't. I oh. didn't realize he would be as oh. well known as as excited as I was. Dude, you got I know about the power of love and everything, Goldie Wilson. All right, all right, Michael. I'm sorry. Sorry, Mike. I didn't mean to <laughs> completely hijack this, but that was just too no, good no, no, that was, of, of an item to no. pass up. So No, that was great. You know, I, I wonder, Jason, uh, if we could continue having like this this uh this this black pop culture political <laughs> conversation. Did you see uh, I think it was Ezra Klein in the New York Times had this extended uh, podcast conversation with Barack Obama, and it, it, Obama was talking. Yeah, he, he's talking about this book and uh, you know a promised land and. Uh, right. But you know, one of the things is the one of the things that stood out to me was I like the way Obama thinks, just in mm -hmm. general. In general, yeah, he's a he's a thoughtful guy. Consider, and he pointed out that as a politician, he's somebody who would consider. The other argument, he said, I think the quote was, I've always been taught to argue with somebody, make their argument better than they can, and then yeah. make your own position. I mm -hmm. wonder, as I was reading this, very thoughtful, very balanced, nuanced, and I asked the question the other day, do you think Barack Obama could be elected in this political climate? I mean, this political climate probably is a result of Barack Ooh. Obama being elected in 2008 and 2012. Yeah, yeah. But... If you take Barack Obama and, and, and 08 and 12 never happens, you put him, well, it never happens with him. Right, right. To say, right. like, put him in this context. Could he, in or, this political environment, be elected? Or will we see, or, or how about this, if I may, Michael, because I love this question. Will we see another? Like, I mean, Kamala Harris is obviously a heartbeat away, and, and who knows if she right. is the future of the party. Will we see, given the fallout from Barack Obama and how it gave rise to Trump and his current political environment, Michael, I'm with you. Will we see another Barack Obama type if one exists elected president? So, That's a great question. So, so it's a combination of two things, right? And, and, and number one, Barack Obama was 
you know, the, the thing about campaigns and the thing about running for president in particular, it is so timing based, right? We're literally talking about time travel. If you had taken Barack Obama back to 2004, he can't win. If you take Barack Obama to 2020, I don't think he can win. Like, you got to hit time at that particular moment. It's like the playoffs. You got to catch this team when they're hurt, injured. Coach has a, you know, a, you know, coach can't be there that week. If he was the perfect guy for the perfect moment and the perfect circumstances. And, and I have to add, because this has to do with we'll see somebody again. Barack Obama had the perfect foil. He got to run against Hillary Clinton. Beating Hillary Clinton was more important to Obama getting elected president than beating John McCain. I want y'all to think about that. Mm. Because what did he do? He showed that this black man could take down the only, one of only two political dynasties left in America. It was the Clintons and the Bushes. And he showed, once he showed America that he could beat Hillary Clinton, they were like, oh, okay. All right, then this black man can run the presidency. So the, the, the idea that he could do that today, I don't know. I don't think he could. I think that that this this presidency that we have now going into 2020, coming out of a pandemic, America was not about to risk the future of this country to somebody who didn't know what they were doing. And let's be honest, Senator Barack Obama had a paper thin resume when he came into office. Paper thin, okay? Like yeah. paper, like crossover paper. Like you ain't really pledged paper, right? So I don't know that he could have gotten in in 2020. Could he get in in 2024? Yes. But this is where this is where we get in with, with with Vice President Harris. I have said this all along. Of the final four that we had, Pence, Trump, Biden, Harris, she was the most qualified, most intelligent, and most capable, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Mm -hmm. I also happen to think America is kind of a racist, sexist place, and I always felt like Senator Harris was the just just assailed by forces that would have been impossible for her to transcend, even if she had run a perfect campaign, which she did not. So jumping ahead to 2024, could a black, straight black man run for president in 2024 and win? I think that's a possibility. Will America be ready for an African-American or an Indian African-American woman to be president in 2024? Not the country I've been watching. <laughs> I don't. I don't trust this country. Yeah. I don't. I don't think that'll happen. Even if she is the most yeah, qualified, same. and she happens to be. So, yeah. That's and and, and here's this the thing. Is, I, I gotta be. Yeah. A lot of people they get angry when you say that because they think it's 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 not about Harris because she's great. It's about this right. country. Yeah. Yeah. No. Hundred percent. So in the, in the meantime, and I, and this is per, this dovetails perfectly to my last question for you, Doc. In the meantime. Mm -hmm. Uh, Kamala Harris has added responsibility, major added responsibility. What is the uh, the symbolism, the significance, and the substance of uh, President Biden uh, appointing her to lead the fight to maintain and, if possible, expand uh, voting rights? So I'm gonna put this in context. So thank you, thank you, Mr. Smith, for asking me this question. Uh, yeah, apparently I was trained. Was that an alley? Was that was that was that a, was that a no look alley? -oop? That, that, the way, like, uh, go ahead. <laughs> Throw it down. It. He caught it. <laughs> go do some and, stuff with it. And uh, you know, I, I was I, I was I was trending for about a day and a half. I was literally at the Nuggets Trailblazers game. I'm trending uh, because of what I said about Biden's speech. And I want to make this very clear about about Vice President Harris and what she's doing and what this means. Look, Joe Biden and Aaron Haynes, who's, who's just a great, incredibly talented uh, writer and editor at the 19th, wrote a great story talking about the fact that Biden seems to be handing off a lot of this hard civil rights work to black women in the administration. Fudge, Harris, uh, uh, Kimberly Clark, who was just put in the Justice Department, which is great, right? You put the people who have the most at stake to make these kinds of decisions, and I think it's good. But here's the overall problem with this. This needs to be at the forefront of something coming out of the president's mouth. And I've said before that for him to essentially show, it's like show, you can't show up at the repast and not bring something. How are you gonna show up to the three remaining survivors, three people who are all over a hundred years old, who are direct survivors of Tulsa violence and you don't have nothing. You hop back in your plane and you go home. You need to cut them a check. And and, and I, I have to point this out because it, it, it's, it, it's not surprising to me, but it's annoying to me. Every other group of people in this country, farmers, um, you know, anti-abortion activists, you know, scientists, any group of people can go to our federal government and say, I want this, I want this, I want this, and we won't stop complaining until you give it to us. 
But somehow when black people ask for things like reparations for people who have been direct victims of white terrorism, suddenly every black person in America decides that they want to become an economist and a political philosopher say, well, we can't do that. Really? Why does that only seem to happen when it comes to black people? We have offered reparations to lots of different groups. We have offered checks to people who have survived natural disasters. If we can give money to people who have been victims of terrorism, Jason, I don't. Eleven, you're saying, Jason? I, no, I, I'm sorry. I don't mean to cut. I don't mean to cut you off. We were talking about this the other day. We talked about this on the uh, hundred. We talked about this on Tuesday. Yeah. I just not, not. There needs to be some form of reparations. I don't right. believe. And tell me if I, I, I'm not a political scientist, so I'm asking this. But this is my 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 opinion. I don't believe that they can write a big enough check, number one. But in the, in the meantime, in the meantime, I think mm -hmm. true reparations would be inconvenient because they want to maintain this very large wealth gap. They're, they, they, they're not interested in writing a check and the problem being done. Right. Overhauling this system and closing that wealth gap and uplifting black America and and, 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 and and trying to repair damage, it's, which is it's probably goal. for the most part irreparable at this point. You know what I'm saying? Like that's not what right. they're interested in doing. You know what I mean? So that's, that's my speculation. That's my uninformed, uneducated speculation. Look, look, Michael, you're exactly right. We live in a world where Danny Ainge lived in Boston and said, I ain't heard nobody say the N word. So we know that people <laughs> don't want to acknowledge what's actually happening in this country. We know that. My particular issue with this, though, is that this is actually the case that you could get by with if this administration had the political will, because it's not something where you can, where all white people are being blamed. It's not something where you can argue, well, we don't know who the real victims are. You know who the victims are. They're right there. We have the documentation. We have you the evidence. What you could, yeah, you, you could actually do this. So not doing it. And, and the things that are being offered, you know, we've got this tax credits, et cetera, et cetera. That's like saying to somebody, hey, I know you don't have any legs, so I'm going to give you this discount. You know, I'm going to give you a credit card to go to the Nike store. <laughs> Yo, right. I, I can't walk. That's not helping me. These people are older. They need more right, than right. that. They can't be paid enough, but they should be paid something. Absolutely. Yeah, and, then, and not, not to mention, yeah, not to mention the, uh, the reparations program, if you want to call it that, it may be an insult going on in the suburbs of Chicago and Evanston, Illinois, where it's not really and, and they and people knew it from the start. Like this is not really the idea, right. the spirit of reparations. Right. I, you, you tell me what's going to happen. Yeah. What's going to happen in your lifetime? True reparations or the Indian African American woman uh, as president? <laughs> <laughs> so I'll say this. I actually think in my lifetime that another woman of color will be in the White House. I 100% believe that that's going to happen again. I don't know if it's as president, you know, universe, God permitting, I'm here for another 50 years or so. Who knows, right? <laughs> but but I am 100% sure that a number, another woman of color will end up in the White House. I don't have any doubts about that. As far as reparations, believe it or not, I think it's less likely than that, but I do think it's going to occur. And I do think it's going to occur because at hmm. some point, you will have a small enough incident where the definition of reparations is going to be changed. And that's what will allow the white majority or the white power holders in this country to get away. Because here's what, they don't want to give money to these people because it's being called reparations. So the moment you call it reparations, then everybody else is going to come up to the trough and be like, I got to get paid. But there's going to be some other act of white terrorism. There's going to be some church that gets burned down. There's going to be some other group of black people who are attacked. And they're going to get some huge settlement. And the federal government's going to get involved. And retroactively, okay. that's going to be called reparations. And that'll be the beginning of the process. That's going to happen. Okay. Oh, okay. Listen, that money got to come from somewhere. So again, I just, yeah. I just don't see a, a big enough check for covering 500 years. But hey, I, I appreciate your optimism <laughs> on that. Before we let you go, and, we, and it's got to be quick because we're up against it. So Gary, roll the music. Um, speaking of stuff <laughs> that you may not see in your lifetime, uh, a Clippers Lakers playoff series. Uh, give us your hot take on the state of LA basketball. Uh, as, as uh, we go. I mean, I'll say, I'll say it quick. These guys are making Luca, Luca look like a star. I'm so mad. <laughs> These guys are trying to look. At this point, this, 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 this last game, this last game, that, that boy Luca's a problem. I mean, he's a problem. But I say that in the most complimentary way possible. And they're going to have to deal with him. If he gets one other star with him, this guy really is going to be a top 10 player 
really probably a top three player over the next five to seven years if he can stay healthy. As far as the Lakers go, I'm sorry I have to say this, but AD is, it's not that AD is brittle, okay? It's that AD doesn't seem to know how to have an impact on this team. And I go after Vogel on this because one player being gone shouldn't be worth a 40-point blowout. I'm sorry. That's absolutely inexcusable. That's bad coaching. The Lakers quit in the second half, and that's all on Vogel's head. And if Jason Kidd is smart, he's polishing off his resume because they already got one ring, and he should go going straight there instead of going to Boston because Boston is going to be an absolute pit of a place to be. He should not head there. He should take over Vogel's job. Dude, I told you. Back full magazine. Just ready. I Just spray. Got Brad Stevens. All right, man. <laughs> and by the way, we'll see you, you, want, next, you we'll see you next about, week. You want yeah. to talk about reparations and welfare? That's Brad Stevens getting a promotion after running this team into the ground for three and a half. <laughs> we'll see you next week. Hey, hey. Um, all, right. all right, all right, Doc. We'll see you guys. We'll talk to you next week. We'll talk about Loki. All right, man. Yeah. Hey, thanks for watching Brother From Another on YouTube. Make sure you hit subscribe before you leave and be sure to watch us 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern Time on Peacock. Appreciate you.